Okay, thank you, everyone. Now, I'm gonna to change tone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Rolf Weinbrunn. Rolf is probably not a stranger to any of us here. Rolf has been here, of course, some time. I'll give a little bit of uh, Rolf's background. Rolf's first degree was in art history and psychology from the University of Winnipeg, and this was followed up by another first degree, a bachelor's degree, called a first degree in the UK, first degree, uh, in biology from the University of Toronto. Then he did a master's at the U of T, and then finally a doctorate at the University of Regina in 1998. So that's the <coughs> academic pedigree. That was followed by a postdoc here with Schindler, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so postdoc here from 98 to 2000. We were postdocs at the same time. Oh. But I never knew you then. No, I was hiding. I was here in 2000. <laughs> um, then I stint four years at the University of Regina as an assistant professor and then came back to the University of Alberta in 2003. Like, I came back in 2004 as an associate professor. You came back in 2003. So this parallel. And you had short hair. <laughs> I remember that. Start growing it now if you want to be chair. Okay. <laughs> uh, and associate came back as an associate professor in 2003, 2013, became a full professor, and he's done lots of really great stuff for the department in the meantime. He had a stint as the associate chair grad, when was that, Rolf? That was 2008 to 2011? Something like that. Right? Yeah. And uh, this year he'll be returning to the executive team as associate chair of research starting this summer. He's currently um, shadowing Keith and we're having a bit of a transition, a bit of an overlap, but he'll be officially taking that position on the 1st of July. So that's who Rolf is, so welcome Rolf. And Rolf is going to brighten our day, right, Rolf? Because going to try. Look at this picture. Um, <laughs> Reading worries over ecological surprises by multiple stressors. So Rolf did say that this was a January theme talk. <laughs> yeah. I acknowledge it's, it's a dark month. But let's uh, give Rolf a hand and welcome him to the okay. stage. Great. All right. Away you go. Thanks, David. Um, I put this one up because, as you now have heard, I've got a arts background, and also I think that uh, Edward Munch's screen kind of like captures and symbolizes something that is really a, a, a common feature in today's ecology, and that is an increasing concern and worry over the rate of global change and how it's actually affecting the world ecologically. So, what is this person actually really worried about? I'm going to try and show you that today. So I'm going to try to alleviate this person and our collective sort of worry over global uh, change by uh, trying to fill the void or the knowledge gap that exists, which is that we don't really have any kind of conceptual foundation upon which to make predictions of cumulative impacts of multiple stressors, nor to actually understand them mechanistically. And uh, this is kind of like uh, going through your old record collection and like suddenly finding an old favorite of yours and going, wow, I haven't listened to this one in a long time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to revive a paper that we published back in 2004 that was kind of a very simplistic attempt at trying to fill this knowledge gap even back then. And it's known as the species co-tolerance concept. And I will go over it because I assume that probably nobody here has probably cited the paper, though it is relatively well cited by others, particularly Europeans for some reason, so there's a connection there. Okay, so first thing I'm going to kind of get to is the motivation for why we're even trying to do this, right? So my kind of field of research deals with the umbrella kind of label of being stress ecology. And for decades long, it's kind of been, been uh, symbolized or kind of like captured by almost decadal kind of primary interest in different types of perturbations associated with human activities. So this kind of like goes back to the 1960s with Rachel Carson and we really start getting an environmental awareness of what we're actually doing to the planet by way of our actions. Um, Eugene Odoms is kind of like the father in my opinion of stress ecology. He really kind of promoted a lot by saying these sorts of things affect ecosystem function and services to humans. And after this, if you're an aquatic ecologist, you, this predates me by a bit, but not by much. Um, the 70s was really kind of characterized by an increasing awareness of cultural eutrophication or excess nutrient runoff from uh, human practices and causing potential blooms like this red tides that are shellfish poisoning off the coasts that receive nutrient flow from land. Also, um, cultural eutrophication of lakes, like we see here in Alberta, where we often get blooms in the summer of potentially toxic blue-green algae or cyanobacteria. 
And this is where David Schindler, kind of, if you recall, kind of really kind of came onto the scene quite strongly. Go to the 80s, and lots of attention diverted over to acid rain, right? And the impacts of industrial acidification, both on particularly freshwater systems, but also terrestrial systems as well. And then when I was a grad student, to do acid rain research was kind of passe. It's because you go to conferences and you'd have these little tiny groups, you know, where you go, I'm doing e biological recovery of acid lakes. Great, kid, there's five people in the audience. Because in the 90s, when I started, all of a sudden, all of us aquatic ecologists, not everyone, but in general, there was a move away from acid rain because it had largely been resolved in the Western Hemisphere, though it still obviously is a big deal in other parts of the world. But you couldn't get away from a conference that didn't have multiple sessions on stratospheric ozone depletion and the effects of UV radiation on aquatic ecosystems. It was everywhere. Laced in it was a lot of things about uh, dissolved organic carbon and how it's a natural photo blocker or photoprotecting for a lot of these organisms from UV. But that was the 90s. And so now here we are in the 21st century and again if you go to uh, oceanography and limnology conference you will see lots of people focusing more on global warming and climate change. So where does this all kind of fit in? So there are these kind of like periods of concern over predominantly very focused stressors or, or things related to human activities. But the thing is that a lot of these problems haven't gone away. Um, like I said, acid rain still exists throughout parts of the world. Um, global warming exists in different parts of the world as well. If we could understand them by just simply saying, well, we've studied all these really well, such that if they're occurring in some combination somewhere in the world, we should be able to, on past knowledge, pretty much predict and understand what the net impact of these are if they're occurring together. That's a simplistic assumption, obviously, because in many cases, um, that's not what actually happens. And one of the first people that kind of really nicely kind of captured this one was Robert Payne in a paper that when Ecosystems, the journal, first kind of came out. And he pointed out this fact that different types of perturbations or human stressors um, often yield ecological surprises because what they do is they interactively mediate each other's direct effects that you don't get what you expect based off the sum of their individual effects. So these things that don't add up, non-additivity is what characterizes a lot of people's uh, understanding of what are ecological surprises. And again, to just kind of get you up to speed if this isn't kind of like your, your, uh, your kind of cup of tea, ecological surprises in some people's minds kind of works th this way. If you happen to have two major stressors here generically labeled A and B, and their net effect, if they were to occur, co-occur, simply adds the sum of their individual effects, then it's an additive outcome, and then we can all basically go home because we would have known that from past studies of their direct effects of the two stressors themselves. But the ecological surprises occur when their net effect doesn't actually eat the sum of their individual effects, and you either get something that's greater than expected an ecological surprise, which people were term as synergies, or you get a net effect that's actually less than the sum of the individual effects, and then you have an antagonism. Often people say antagonisms aren't as bad as synergies, but it's very context dependent. In both cases, they're very often un unexpected. Um, like I said, the reason why they're unexpected is because we don't really have very much knowledge about the types of interactions that occur between different stressors that mediate their direct effects. And that was captured really nicely in a paper back in Science by uh, Sala et al. that essentially did a very simple modeling exercise where they assembled a whole bunch of different types of experts from around the world that were very um, experienced with biodiversity uh, inventories and environmental conditions. And they ran a very simple model where they asked all of these experts to rank the different types of stressors around the world in terms of the relative impact on biodiversity within their region and they ran three different types of models. So the very top one here is there are no act interactions occurring between any of the stressors from any part of the world. In each area, they're essentially operating independently. So that's like your additive outcome. So the world map of biodiversity loss here in terms of absolute loss of biodiversity or species richness is mapped the way it looks. If they change the model ever so slightly and go, let's try and do an antagonistic scenario where the dominant top-ranked stressor within each region really kind of 
dictates what the biodiversity loss will be like, and all of the other stressors in that area really don't matter because they're overshadowed by the first one. So this is where it's kind of like the maximum worst stressor is driving all of this change in biodiversity. And you can see the map changes. And then the one at the bottom is kind of a multiplicative scenario where the various stressors in each region of the world multiply each other's effects such that you get a much more pronounced effect than you would based off the sum of their individual. And here again, the map changes. The actual pattern of the map doesn't really matter. It's that in each case, depending on the predominant type of interaction or no interaction, the entire forecast of biodiversity change over the next 100 years completely changes. So this paper came out and said, interactions are the highest degree of uncertainty surrounding cumulative impacts of multiple stressors. We've got to get a better handle on them to understand if they are, which one of these scenarios is perhaps the most prevalent. So for quite a while, I'm turning back to aquatics here for a second, a lot of my colleagues would use, uh, would look at multiple stressors, but they would be looking at it much more from an abiotic perspective. And they weren't really looking at it in terms of the biological effects. So here's some really classic well-cited papers from Nature, one by David Schindler, where they were looking at different types of environmental changes and saying, well, this really affects things within the lake. But looking at the actual community impacts and the ecological impacts of these sorts of studies was really not um, heavily considered in these papers or in many others. But we knew interactions were occurring in the external environment across these different things. So then the question still was, are these sorts of interactions having non-additive effects on biological uh, levels of biological organization. So these were from the late 80s, and then by about 2008, let me point to Stephanie right here because she was probably somewhere around that, almost that time, not quite. I shouldn't date you, but. <laughs> but from Isabella Cote and Emily Darling <laughs> had a paper in 2008 in Ecology Letters that was one of the first meta-analyses that tried to show that if you look at the metric of animal mortality, that in most cases, uh, factorial experiments that cross different types of stressors uh, typically had results that did not agree with the additive uh, expected outcome. So here's the, ex uh, the predicted additive outcome based off of the individual effects of the different stressors across all these studies. And here's what was actually observed in actually occurring. So you can see right away, not too many of those outcomes fall on the one-to-one -one line. So in most cases, the outcome was not additive. Uh, as predicted. Instead, it was either below additive or above, synergistic or antagonistic. So there's a lot of data here showing that with what we have actually come to know with the accumulation of studies that non-additive effects, at least in this meta-analysis, are the rule rather than the exception. At the very, very same time, another group from UC Santa Barbara published a meta-analysis in the same journal with you know, pages apart, which is kind of interesting. But they looked more specifically at marine systems and did a meta-analysis again. If the additive outcome from their uh, literature synthesis were to be realized, then that would approximate the zero line here. You can see in all cases here, regardless of the overall study of 171 or community or population level, primary production or heterotroph, none of those sorts of effects actually fall on the additive sort of outcome. They're all either above or below. So again, non-additive stressors that are the result of interactions are the norm rather than the rule. And then the last one we just published a couple of years ago or th a few years ago was how about in freshwater systems? And so this was a paper that we collaborated with my PhD student and people in South Africa. And here again, if it would have been additive outcomes, the meta-analysis effect sizes would have been uh, at zero. But in this particular case, it was really interesting in that we found that in many different cases, I'm just going to show you one graph, that the net effects typically were less than additive or antagonistic. So kind of like to show you that in multiple stressor land, non-additive outcomes are the norm rather than the exception. So let's go after if we can actually get a handle on how these actually occur. So what's my guiding objective? So I'm going to try to explore by reviving this old concept that we published back in 2004 and see if we can actually kind of upgrade it um, to make it uh, for a better tool for perhaps at least predicting, possibly understanding the uh, 
net impacts of different types of, again, this is a stressor definition here, anthropogenically driven extreme and novel environmental effects. So this sets us apart from the huge area of literature that you're probably f uh, familiar with that's disturbance ecology. These are extreme disturbances or very novel disturbances such as in the case of chemical toxins. And so what I'm going to try and do with this whole presentation, I'll try to hit home a take home message which you won't understand possibly right now if you li unless you like Skittles. And it's going to look something like this, but I'll explain it at the end of my talk. But we're working towards this particular type of interactive network model of species tolerances, traits, and interactions between the species. Okay, so where do we go? So where is this talk headed? First thing I'm going to do is explain to you what does this figure here mean right now, because this actually is the original uh, illustration that we used when we published the species co-tolerance concept. After we get through that, I'm going to show you that there's a problem with what kind of null model you use to actually define whether a net effect is antagonistic or synergistic. It's not as simple as it seems by just comparing it to the additive outcome. So we're going to search for a better null model. I'll show you how we've integrated species traits and species interactions to make this very simplistic first step a little bit more ecologically dynamic. And then hopefully I'll get through this fast enough so I can give you a couple of working examples experimental examples to show you how this all runs. Okay, so here we go. Species call a co-tolerance concept, how this is actually works. So I'm going to do this really simplistic. The, our first basis was we were a whole bunch of us got to go to Switzerland back in 2003 and we went to a former nudist colony and got stuck in a room, I think about 10 of us, and we couldn't leave the room until uh, for food or until we had a manuscript produced. So. <laughs> So there were photographs of people that were nude in the 20s and stuff on the wall, but you know, it, it was just now a research think tank. <laughs> okay, get that straight. So the first thing we came up with was, well, let's think about the very simple, what if we have two stressors instead of one? Because the literature had been predominantly considering one stress at a time. So here we are, here's our, what we called our null working model. There's no relationship between these four individual species in terms of how well they tolerate stressor A or B. So it's a random distribution. If we apply a very simple sort of side of extinction zone to this particular diagram, stressor A is applied first, it would knock out the two species with the lowest tolerance, leaving the other two species untouched. Stressor B would come along and knock out that one at the bottom there. So you would have about a 75% loss of species richness in this random distribution, non-correlated co-tolerance plot. The negative scenario we played with was kind of like your worst case scenario. This is where if one vice doesn't kill you, your other, the other vice you're engaging in will. So it's an ecological trade-off. So one stressor knocks out two species that are lacking tolerance, leaving behind two of the other species, which however also cannot tolerate stressor B, and you have complete extirpation of all the species within this hypothetical community. So like I said, worst case scenario, positive co-tolerance is your, well, you can consider it perhaps your best case scenario, because in this particular case, you have species that are technically or hypothetically very, very tolerant of all stressors, including these two such that when one stressor is applied, it essentially eliminates or offsets the effect of stressor B. Some people, we use the term, said this is a kind of like more reflective of an antagonistic scenario because one stressor is essentially negating the effect of the other. So here you have half of the species uh, existing. So this paper was published, like I said, quite a while ago. Um, we just all got back together again just recently in Germany and we've got a paper under review right now where the PhD student who's uh, James Orr from Ireland did a citation network to kind of like show where our paper actually fits and so if you can kind of make out because there's a whole bunch of little tiny <laughs> things right here. Uh, that paper right here is essentially cited very well about 400 times by freshwater ecologists, marine ecologists, ecotoxicologists and the people that don't seem to cite it for some strange reason happen to be community ecologists that are terrestrial. So they're all way over here. <laughs> it's a difference in terminology. They don't seem to like the word stressor in particular. So, but anyways, all the other folks, communities kind of agree. In particular, 
what I was, when we look back over who's citing this paper, lots of marine people cited, more even than freshwater people. Um, and some of the really nice examples is that they use the species co-tolerance concept, not really for predictive purposes, but they use it more to kind of like understand and interpret their <coughs> findings. So a really nice paper that came out back in 2011, I think it's Nick, it's not Nick or Neil, Nick, Nick Graham, right, out of Australia. So, so Nick emailed me before he wrote this paper and he said, I'm going to use that as a co-tolerance idea and I'm going to use it for uh, coral fish species uh, vulnerability to climate change uh, here on the x-axis and vulnerability to fish harvesting. And so he got also uh, a number of experts together on this publication and they essentially plotted the assessed vulnerability of all these different species to these types of stressors and they came up with this particular type of relationship. It's a negative correlation, it's curvilinear instead of uh, linear, but it's interesting in this particular case, a lot of the species are down here in what they term kind of the winter zone. They're relatively insensitive to both, and it's only certain species that are either very, very obligated to eating coral, that are very sensitive to climate change because of the bleaching effect, or roving species that are very, very motile and very easily captured by way of the fishing methods. So, the interesting thing here is that this paper was the first one that I could see that finally put some identity to those simple plots we showed at the beginning where it's all black dots, every species is exactly the same. Here there were traits actually be, being given to the individual species, which gave it a little bit more ecological information and a little bit more insight. At the very same time almost, Emily uh, Darling with Isabel Cote at SFU was working on the coral species in a different sort of system. And the coral species she also plotted in relationship to bleaching sensitivity, climate change, and to fish uh, sensitivity. You kind of go, what's with fish and coral? The fish practices here are essentially trampling of the coral by way of people that actually fish directly on the reefs for the fish themselves. So the coral take it on the chin as well. And I remember I was the external examiner for Emily and I said, did you see Graham's paper, you know, like a couple of years ago, he said, this is perfect overlay of you two guys. And so um, you can see here, again, she put in species traits. And then in some cases, there's very obvious ecological trade-offs. The competitive species really take it on the chin. They have high sensitivity to both. Weedy species that grow very quickly also are not very well fared. Again, it was the winners down here that were relatively more slow-growing, stress-tolerant species that were seen to survive the impacts. So the marine people used this a lot. And then this paper came out. And I was like, wow, look at that. There it is again. And like sometimes you, you don't see this paper until it's out there. And you kind of go, why didn't I get to uh, review this one? Exactly looks like ours, co-tolerance plot. And they went out and they said, you know what? The random distribution is additive. And these other ones are, are non-additive or they are synergistic and antagonistic. And right away, we started going, this isn't sitting right with us. Because when we were, back in 2004, we were struggling whether or not the random distribution was truly additive. And so I want to show you the quest we've had for trying to find a null model for better defining what the net impacts of two stressors are on a community. So. See, I'm going to get this one right. Da, da, da. So here's the negative cotolerance scenario revisited again. The first stressor knocks out two species. The next one knocks out two species. That works out perfectly. It's an additive outcome. But if you look at the positive one, knocks out two species, and then the other stressor comes along, and it would knock out the same two species. So in this particular case right here, you've got a problem where the two effects are not additive because you have double kills. You can't kill a species twice in this particular example. So this was kind of our red flag already from the very beginning. And this is kind of like what's captured right here. The additive approach to looking at species extinctions within a community exposed to two stressors suffers from overestimating the net effect of two stressors if they happen to be very redundant in taking out the same species. Because these species right here are actually extirpated twice. So that can happen. 
It doesn't stop there. The other problem with the additive effect is that it doesn't deal very well with predicting the net effect of two stressors that have sublethal effects individually on certain species. So in this particular case, response to stressor A, these particular species here um, would survive. However, two of these might be suppressed somewhat by A, but not ex extirpated. But if stressor B comes along, those two species over there eventually then are removed from the community. You can't capture that within the additive scenario. And the other thing that happens is it doesn't capture the effect of stressors that have opposing effects within a community. So you can have negative stressors. A positive stressor might be something like fertilizer addition or something like this. In this particular case, the negative effect of one stressor is offset by the positive effect of the second stressor. These two species actually would survive. Again, in this case, the additive model would in fact overestimate the number of species that's actually being lost. So how do you get around this problem? So we've been scratching our head about this for quite a while and had a postdoc, Patrick Thompson, kind of come by, who was an undergrad here from the U of A from years ago. And he said, you know, Ralph, I've been thinking about this. And I got, yeah. And he goes, I've got the idea. And I said, <laughs> oh, wow, that's great, okay. So he had the idea. So in a nutshell, what what Patrick kind of told, kind of we came up with was we went through a modeling exercise where instead of like doing these blanket sort of stressor A reduces this many species, stressor B reduces that many, we break it down into each individual species response to both of the stressors. Such that this is the response of each species to uh, stressors depending on stressor from J to S. And this is its response in the non-stress control. This is the effect of the stressor. It, how many stressors is added up. And the max term is basically that if, if the net effect of multiple stressors exceeds um, the 100% of the species in question, such that it's not possible that you can kill a species twice, then it's essentially the system is then uh, corrected to zero. So you get away from that double kill sort of problem. So when we do the simulation model runs with this sort of scenario, we have stressor A and B being applied. This is species richness change relative to control. So everything's negative here because it's negative stressors in this case. And the X gradient is stressor gradient or stressor magnitude is on the X axis. So here you can see the effect of stressor A, B, the net effect of A and B shown in the solid line. The additive model in this particular case doesn't track that uh, combined effect very well. In fact, here it overestimates like we were talking about. There is a multiplicative null model that I'm not going to have time to go into. It also has the same sort of problem. The compositional model where you consider the effect of each individual species and then sum it to come up with your prediction actually tracks pretty closely to what is observed, as you can see there with the green and the black uh, agreeing quite well. So this is gained some traction in community ecology where people are trying to use this null model. Okay, so we've got a null model that's not at least improved over the additive. So next thing was go back to that really simple model and go, okay, well, in these co-tolerance plots, there's no species identity, there's no traits, and they all seem to be operating independently. So what you really have here in the first uh, idea is that uh, species interactions don't matter to how species tolerate stressors or external stressors. But we know that that has to happen because if this hypothetical community was linked by reciprocal negative interactions, such that would epitomize a competitive co community, then their stressor or tolerances might actually be suppressed by way of interference from a, a neighboring competitor. So their tolerances might, might actually shift in a downward direction. Uh, conversely, if you had a community within a highly stressful extreme environment, you might in fact see these four individual species hypothetically having interactions that are reciprocally positive in nature and facilitation or mutualistic such that they might actually enhance their tolerances collectively to be more tolerant to the external stressors. And this one's pretty well founded in some of the plant community ecology literature, um, the stress Facilitation hypothesis by Ragan Calloway from Montana shows that you put certain species into stressful conditions and they will show uh, much more cooperative interactions with one another. So we went, okay, how can we do this? So 
Patrick comes along again <laughs> and says, I've got another equation for you. And it's like, oh, this is great. Okay, explain this one. So what we did here is we took each individual species within a hypothetical community of 20 species and modeled its rate of, uh, rate of growth as a function of its growth rate, its sensitivity and mortality due to stressor A, uh, mortality due to stressor B, and then the collective uh, effect of diffuse interaction from all of the other 19 species within that hypothetical community. So just by changing the coefficient there, you could either make it competitive, uh, mutualistic, or in, in one case, like I'll show you, we just did a kind of random mix where all kinds of interactions could be occurring. And I'll just show you this really quick. So basically, the take-home message was that if you're looking at, again, the number of species relative to the unstressed control, if you have a community that is heavily made up of competitive interactions, in all cases, regardless of how the stressors are being applied, either positive effect or negative effect, um, in all cases, species loss is much more profound in the case where the community is made up mostly of com competitive interactions. If you have a facilitative interaction where there's reciprocal positives, you can see by the blue line that the amount of species loss is actually minimized. So, this was a model result, and I was going, Patrick, that's great, but I'm more of an experimentalist, so I was kind of like, oh, yeah, okay, Let, let's see if this actually pans out. Can we actually do an experiment? So, we tested this sort of prediction um, using assemblage of algal species that we have been growing up in the fifth floor since I've been here, and I think this algal culture collection dates back to the 1980s, maybe. Um, it was something that really kind of attracted me here when I first interviewed back in 2003. And I went, wow, there's not many places that have this kind of culture collection growing actively within their departments. So what we did, these guys are great for working with. Um, they all have very, very distinct morphologies, ecological roles. Um, they're relatively fast and responsive at, at, in experiments. So what we did is we determined the um, tolerance of each one of these species to a number of different types of stressors. I'm only going to show you one example. The tolerance to acidification and the tolerance to uh, gradual heating events. And we grew them individually as monocultures and to assess their tolerance. And then we put them at the very same time collectively into a community or a polyculture and also looked at their individual tolerances as well. And then this is the cartoon diagram that I showed. So these are all the, I think what we had, eight species out of 10 survived. Um, they're all shown right here. When grown individually, most of them respond negatively to acidification and negatively to, to heating. There's only one species that's not in that kind of like, that kind of like double hit zone. But when you grew them simultaneously, right beside under the same culture conditions collectively as a community or a polyculture, you actually see that there are a few species that increase in tolerance to the two stressors. So there was sort of a facilitation sort of interaction occurring between this, in, within this community such that some of these species actually showed higher tolerance when grown together than when they're grown by themselves. So you would think, well, that's going to probably bode well for the community in terms of total production because now we have some species that are actually showing positive response to the stressors as opposed to before. But if you apply the null model, our compositional null model that I just went over, um, we can definitively say that that was not the case because what instead we got was we got a synergistic negative effect, a negative effect greater than we would have predicted off of the null model um, so that that positive tolerance didn't help at all this community, even though there seemed to be facilitation occurring. And the reason was because of this. So here are all the species grown in the controls as shown as the respective colors. And then there are all of the species shown how they responded after the two stressors were actually applied. So what you can kind of take away from this diagram is that those species that exhibited positive co-tolerance when grown together as a community were actually species that were not really big drivers in terms of production to the whole community on a whole. They were relatively low in productivity. 
The species that didn't benefit from the facilitative interactions from being with its neighbors were the very, very productive species, and they also happened to be the much more sensitive ones. So even though there was some tolerance induced by growing together as a community, it did not offset the negative effect of the two stressors because there was a trade-off between if you're stress tolerant, you probably have very low productivity to contribute to the community. So this kind of showed this really interesting thing about interactions are at play and there are also traits at play as well. So now I'm going to take you out of the lab, out of the, what Dave Schindler would call the pickle jar experiments. Though I'm still not going to get away from it. I can hear them in my head. <laughs> so now I'm going to go to where we work as well. So we work up in the high alpine in a lot of remote areas of the Canadian National Mountain Parks. This is the Devon Lakes in the far northeast corner of Banff National Park. And some of them are influenced by glaciers, <coughs> some of them are not. But uh, more importantly, if you would have been in this area uh, a few decades ago, you would have seen a bush plane or possibly a helicopter unloading its cargo of tens of thousands of sport fish fingerlings. Typically also not native. Brown trout from Europe, um, brook trout from Eastern North America, and as long as a few of them survived on impact, you suddenly had this beautiful fishless mountain lake that now also had attractive angling appeal. So it increases um, park revenue, tour re re revenue due to tourism. So, in fact, I got this one postcard, I can't remember from where, that was a promotional postcard for what these sorts of things could actually achieve for you if you were to visit a mountain park. You could possibly <laughs> land a rainbow trout that's as big as a horse. And this predates Adobe Photoshop, so I don't know how they did a really good, it looks really convincing. And you can show it to some people that don't really know fish or horse well, and they just look at it and you don't get anything out of them. It's like, no, this is really something else, right? So, this is a stress. It's a novel predator within a system that's completely naive to having ever seen fish like anything like this before because of where they are uh, located in these high elevational areas. But one thing that's pretty well established is when you add this sort of size selective predator into a system where there's lots of invertebrates that have never seen a large predator like this before, there's a very strong size selection and it selects for very small species of invertebrates that can elude the fish because they're too small to actually be easily recognized by a visual feeding predator. So there's active body trait selection here for smaller sized bodies. So this is one stressor, been around for quite a while, for a, a, almost a century. More recently, at the same time, and this is a paper I think that has some U of A connection to it, um, rates of warming around the world are occurring at a fast, are occurring at a faster rate than at higher elevations than at lower elevations. So these high elevation lakes stocked with fish that have small invertebrates in them as well um, are also being heated up. So this is your stressor B, whereas the fish stocking was stressor A. And the interesting thing here is that it operates on the same sort of body size selection mechanism where higher temperatures uh, typically involve a impart a greater metabolic cost to self-regulation in larger sized organisms than in smaller sized organisms. So higher temperatures select for smaller species. The novel exotic visual predator also selects for smaller species as well. If you put these two st stressors together and think about it in the context of body size selection, you come up with a hypothetical cotolerance plot that looks a little bit like this. So based off survey data from a number of mountain lakes and a little bit of simplistic network uh, analyses, these, this is what we really have to, to look at for a hypothesis. So the idea here was that body size selection kind of follows this hypothesis of uh, cotolerance sort of relationship such that the two stressors should actually negate uh, or antagonize one another such that their net effect should be less than the sum of their individuals because there's a high amount of redundancy and that they both select for smaller body size. And the top predator here, I know this is not impressive for people that work with vertebrates. The top predator in these fishless lakes is a phantom midge uh, known as a Chaobarus. It's, it's a really cool predator that uh, captures all kinds of zooplankton as long as the zooplankton's small enough for its gape to actually uh, accommodate. And the other interactions that I'm showing here 
the two species are missing for some reason, are largely competitive interactions between either omnivorous species or herbivorous species that are shown right up there. Smaller species at the top, more tolerance to both stressors than the large predator at the bottom. So this was off survey data, and we thought, well, maybe we're going to get, maybe our survey data is somehow wrong, and this is not what's happening. So we had the alternate hypothesis that maybe it could look like something other than positive correlation. The important thing here is that, in the previous, I should have said it first. In this example right here, it doesn't matter which stressor you apply first. At least that's what we hypothesized, because the first stressor takes out uh, Chaobarus, um, the second one also kind of takes out Chaobarus, favors the species up on the upper right. So if they both have exactly the same sort of effect, it doesn't matter if they're exposed to the first one, like they were with the fish introduction and then climate change or higher temperature or reverse. But if it looks something like this and our survey results network analysis is kind of wrong, then maybe there is an importance of stressor order. Because in this particular case, it really matters which stressor is applied first. If the fish effect is applied first, you knock out the top invertebrate predator and everything changes. If, however, you were to say, let's first add the, t the temperature effect, you would actually promote uh, pr uh, pr possibly the production of the Chaobarus and you'd have a much more higher abundance of Chaobarus predation before the fish were actually added. So the question is, does order of exposure matter to the net effect of two stressors on this particular community. So here's an experiment that we ran. Um, into two parts, six different types of treatment combinations. First fish exposures for the first three weeks, then the temperature was increased. We did the reverse. First we warmed up the, the experimental units, I'll show you in the next slide. Then we added the fish. We had the one also where it was fish and warming consistently from day zero all the way to the end. Fish only to figure out the, the direct effect, warming to only figure out the warming effect, and then we had our control. So, Schindler's still gonna call these pickle jars, but they're bigger. <laughs> they're 1,500 liter cubitainers, um, all situated at Katanaskis Field Station, and we've used these for a series of different types of experiments. All you need to do is add one rainbow trout fingerling. It does the job, obviously, in these tanks because the prey really don't have anywhere to go. But lots of prey actually still, or not prey because they're not eaten, but a lot of invertebrates still elude the fish because of their size, like I mentioned. So this was a PhD chapter from Megan McClellan. And what she found was that in the treatments where it was first fish and then it was warmed afterwards, the effect of the various species and Chaobarus, the predator is shown right down here. Um, the, the response in the controls are the black and the response in the two stressed systems are shown in gray. And what you can see right here is there's complete extirpation of these larger species here in the bottom left corner. And a lot of the smaller species experience release from predation or competition from the larger species in the bottom left, and they flourish in the presence of tank, of, of fish. If we reverse it, and this is the thing that was kind of like, oh, it looks the same. It's like, oh, we wanted to demonstrate the importance of order of exposure, but we didn't get it because there's positive cotolerance exhibited here, so the two stressors are essentially redundant each species responds in the same way to both stressors, so it doesn't matter which one's applied first. And if it would have been the reverse, we probably would have had a much more interesting sort of outcome, but we're looking for the holy grail now of negative cotolerance to two stressors to demonstrate order can matter. Um, so, if at the species level, nothing's really occurring or differing, then you would imagine that the gross aggregate property of secondary production, nothing would happen as well, and you'd be right. Because over the course of the experiment, the only thing you really need to see here is the warming, then the predator, the fish, and or the predator, and then the warming. Those two bars you can kind of see essentially do not, over the course of the six week experiment, really ever diverge substantially from one another. The only one that really does is that if you include warming and fish from the day zero, by Week six, you have a much higher level of primary production or secondary production because the fish are consistently always excreting nutrients that are then fertilizing the entire 
uh, food web in the system. But that was just one application of how you can actually use these sorts of plots. So where we're going now, and I think that's really where I'm going to probably end my talk, is we're going to be using more network analyses on survey-based data because as I showed you, it's the realized tolerances that are really useful for looking at uh, predictions rather than lab-derived fundamental tolerances because of the importance of interactions. So survey data can actually help you formulate these cotolerance plots if you survey along relatively orthogonal stress gradients. So, um, so the warning is don't be deceived by the intuitively attractive additive model. If you're a community ecologist, look somewhere else. Our compositional model, I think, works relatively well. Uh, involves body or uh, traits that are stress related. Tolerance is obviously one, but with tolerance, there's things such as body size, uh, trophic position, possibly. Um, and with trophic positions, that also points to the importance of interactions as well. Um, we've only started working with network analyses to do this sort of approach, but I think it holds a lot of sort of potential. So with that, I would like to acknowledge all of the funding sources and because uh, I thought this might go a little bit overboard, I'm just going to send out a positive karma to all of the lab that did all this sorts of stuff and then just ask for questions. So thanks. That was brighter. Yeah, Thank you. brighter than expected. Right. So when you're talking about the stresses, it looks like they're all yes or no. There's not oh, yeah. looking at a range of temperatures. So is, I mean, is there an additive effect in terms of stress or intensity? Or yes. Okay. So I catch, this is not meant to insult the audience, but I tried to keep it relatively straightforward. So I used categorical species, species extinction, like yes, no, right? right? If you actually go more with a continuous variable, like say biomass production, the story gets a lot more complicated. I meant input. Input. The input the oh, you mean, oh, yeah, so some of the model simulations that we showed where the, the, the magnitude of the stressor does actually matter. Okay. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the other thing that's important that I didn't get to today is also the asymmetry, the extent of imbalance between the two magnitudes of two stressors or more stressors, also tends to have a much more influential effect on what their net outcome is as well. If you have really strong asymmetry, you usually have an antagonism where one dominant stressor pretty much overshadows all the rest. The synergies and additivities kind of seem to come more often when there's a higher level of degree of symmetry between the individual stressor effects. So there's no sort of magic little extra dash if something causes the other one to just shoot off the scale or something like that? No, I don't, yeah. Haven't, it'd probably be largely context dependent too upon what stressor you're actually talking about, right? But yeah, Aaron. Following with that logic. Or what? Linear. Right. Yes. I mean, many stressors might be early positive, nope. negative. So what implications does that have? Absolutely. Yeah, so stress, stress response ratio, or stress response surfaces are something that's a very common thing. Linearity is the common assumption. Absolutely agree with you that that's probably not the case in many, in many forms. Yeah. But do you have a yeah, I mean, again, with increasing intensity of the stressor, you would imagine that greater nonlinearity is going to, there's going to be a threshold response at some point, right? At, at low levels, the linearity might be there better expressed, but if you hold it over a larger range of magnitude, that linearity is going to break down at some point. Yeah. Oh, Lisa. Mm. And if they can go in reverse, but I'm thinking if you're knocking out species in their entirety, of course you can't reverse it. But if they're just knocked down a yep. little better, if a species reduces the body size, it's the same organism yep. fundamentally. Can you remove the stress and and predict what will happen? So there's a couple of things there. One is we didn't talk about adaptation which is, I mean, there's a, there's a time component here. A lot of this is kind of like in the here and now, it's instantaneous, short-term sort of perspective. There's a level for adaptation that could obviously cause like some form of, or help promote remediation. The other thing, again, I only had 50 minutes, but another thing is if you actually deal with communities exposed to stressors in a much more kind of like spatial context, so like something like a meta-community, 
then you can get a lot of rescue effects from a regional species pool that can help circumvent damage to a local community if that stressor were to kind of like, you know, start being relieved or, or removed. And uh, we've done that sort of stuff too, where it really depends on the difference between how large is the regional species pool surrounding the locally stressed community. If there's a huge difference in diversity between the two, the rescue potential is greater, but it also depends on dispersal ability. But these guys, in general, disperse relatively really well. So that dispersal... The fish are in airplanes. The fi <laughs> no, not the fish. Yeah, not the fish. The fish are in airplanes. But uh, waterfowl and stuff like this carry around zooplankton resting structures from one lake to another and stuff. So they, they can get... Dispersal is actually quite high for these guys. Right. Even though I came late, I also ask a question. But you warned me. I warned you. Yeah. So I think it's fantastic that you have all of these different taxa that you know intimately from the algae up to the vertebrates. Yeah. When are you going to be adding the viruses and the oh. bacteria, oh. that other trophic yes. level category that no one likes to talk about because it's too hard? Right. We could, uh, we could deliberately add one as a, as a stress manipulation, but yeah. Yeah, you know, you know that you're at the cutting edge on this sort of thing because aquatic <laughs> ecologists don't really talk about viruses that much, yes. but it's they are down, increasingly. It's getting more and more yes, and more no, I know, I know. The, the diseases. But that would complicate this even one factor I more, don't want right? right? <laughs> then the simplicity of these nice, simple models would go away, and I just kind of like have it looking even more messy than it is, <laughs> right? But no, you're right, absolutely. So the, the lack of us terrestrial folks <laughs> listening to you. Yeah, <laughs> what is with that? I think that's because our, I think our, my, our perception is habitat loss is our primary driver. And thus, when it's gone, that's our major stressor and everything else is decimal bust in comparison to yours where I'm in a lake, the habitat is, quote, still there. Unless there's drought and it dries up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It disappears. But then that's, it's just gone. Right. And thereby, there's no stressors. Is, do you think that plays into the lack of vision? That's a good point, because we are. Well, yeah, no, I know, I know. Like, their perspectives are always, I have the habitat. Yep. And now it's stressors on top of that. Yep. And in my world, it's like, yeah, 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 whatever. I just lost fifty percent of the habitat, but I don't worry about it. I don't care if the rest of that stuff is decimal. That could very well be, and also with your habitat loss, with you looking at longer, slower, longer, slower growing species, larger species, I think it's more of a big deal. Whereas with us, even like, you ima imagine a small lake under an extreme drought drying up, okay? And go, okay, we just lost the habitat. But if you rehydrate that lake, the, the resting structures, the seed bank that resides within the sediments, something's going to come back pretty quick. Whereas, right, if you take your habitat away, you know, like from, for a, from a large ungulate or something, that's it, right? Well, it's not true in the vertical place. Right, it's right. It's amazing how quickly these things come back. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So. But on a, I think on a slow, unless you're dealing with plants, but on a slower sort of time scale, I think, than with aquatics. Unless we're talking about fish. Then you got a problem. Or just one. Speaking yeah. of fish, you were treating the fish as a stressor, right? But yeah, I hate them. There are organisms in there, too. So what happens to the fish population? I mean, are they... Are they doing better or worse depending on the stressors on the other species in the, in the uh, environment? Yes. The, uh, so if we're talking about native versus non-native? Um, well, you, 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 like, you've, got, you, you've got fish in there and you're, you're looking at, at, at changes in all of the invertebrate organisms, right? Yep. If there are fish in there already that are native and they are being exposed to an introduced exotic species, like what I was showing you here with the case with rainbow trout, the native fish do take it on the chin to a certain extent because there is a, f a fair amount of competition, plus there's usually hybridization since they're all closely related cell monids. But how do the exotic fish do as a function of the response of the other organisms? Oh, I see. You know, are, are they, yeah. they eating everything, everything yep. else drops, they drop out, yep. are they getting an equilibrium, well, something else going on there? So on that point, increasing temperatures would increase the, the feeding rate, but also in these relatively poor lakes, 
that increase in feeding rate not, may not be actually sustainable to meet the metabolic costs that are increased due to warmer temperatures. So the fish, one of the stresses could actually have an, in, an effect or be affected by the other stressor as well. But the, the decrease in the, in the food also is a stressor for Yep, them. yep. So, yeah. so it cuts both ways. Yeah. No, you're right. All right. Thanks, thanks yeah. everybody. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Rolf. No problem. It's my pleasure to, to um, hand over oh, wow. a much coveted Department of Biological Sciences inspired discovery for a better world water bottle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and last note, um, February 13th, Lisa Willis is the uh, next chair's speaker. So thank you, Rolf. Right. Again. Thank you. Thanks, folks. You're ready. Good stuff. There we go. I know it's a little Mickey Mouse-ish, but at least that, that way everyone kind of goes, oh, I know what he's saying. I always hate talks where you kind of lose track early I on. I know you had those microcosms in yeah. Are yeah. they yours? Yeah, they, uh, no, they're ours. Uh, we've, got, we've got 30 of them at the field station. We have 30 of them situated about 8 kilometers away from Sunday.